Angel Church. My name is Janet McLean. Maybe with God there is love. Maybe with God here in our midst we will hear those words that still split open heavens. You are my son. You are my daughter. You are my beloved. You, you are the pride of my life. In you I am well pleased. Maybe this is why we gather together week after week after week here at Pilgrim. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome in this place, not just by me, but by God, who revealed herself in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, our brother and our friend. So welcome to Pilgrim. <clears throat> by the Spirit. That is, the Gentiles have become fellow heirs, members of the same body, and sharers in the promise of Christ Jesus through the Gospel. Of this Gospel I have become a servant according to the gift of God's grace that was given to me through the working of His power. Although I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to me to bring to the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ and to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden in it for ages in God who created all things. So that through the church, the wisdom of God and its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose that he has carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have access to God in boldness and confidence through faith in him. Our second reading is from Matthew, second chapter, verses 1 through 12, which I seem to have misplaced. But there we are. And this is the story that uh, Maureen was describing to the children. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. 
and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. The word of God for the people of God. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, you who are our rock and redeemer. Amen. Religion is a funny thing. Every faith I know anything about prays for peace on earth and goodwill to all. Or they pray for balance and harmony in creation. And at the same time, they draw a sharp line between us and them, between people whom God favors, us, and people who God rejects, them. Those who are in and those who are out. The peace that we pray for each in our separate gatherings turns out to be for us. And often, though not always, the goodwill of good will come. We each imagine when every one of them agrees with us. All that we will be praying for, all that we want, will happen when everybody agrees with me. Thank you very much. How is it that we lump communities into us and them? How is it that sometimes, very rarely, but sometimes we don't? A pastor tells a story of a number of churches joined together in an ecumenical project. They meet together, they study together, they work together for months. And afterward, they were asked about what had surprised them most about this project. And one person said that he was surprised that there were some Christians in denominations besides his own. <laughs> Every time that I hear that story, it reminds me of a chapter in my own life when I was in the fourth grade in Lewiston, Maine, and Tammy Lavasser, who Susan might remember, Tammy Lavasser was my friend down the block, and she was one of the few people on the block who would engage in conversations about faith and God with me. And in one such conversation, I was stunned to learn that she did not think or realize that Catholics were actually Christian. Her us and them moment was de definitely engulfed by my own us and them moment. Because in her deciding we weren't us, I had to decide she was them. <laughs> Tomorrow, January 6th, is Epiphany, the 12th day of Christmas. Drummers are drumming, pipers are piping, lords are leaping, ladies are dancing, and the partridge is still in the same old pear tree. More importantly, Epiphany is the day that we tell the story of the Magi, who travels so far to honor the baby Jesus. It is not clear who these strangers are, it is only clear that they are strange. They are foreigners. They are from the east. They watch the stars. Perhaps they come from Babylon. Certainly they are pagans. Here in this story, my friends, we have an interfaith encounter. Epiphany is the season of surprises. So stop and think. In a religious world that is very careful to distinguish us from them, this group of them 
arrives as pagans, and they leave as pagans too. They leave with the same worldview that they came with, following the sacred wherever it shows itself. In their honoring of this baby, it didn't require that they become or believe other than what they already believed. What is more, these particular sages from the East, they appear to be astrologers. We think that because, like, you know, they were following a star. And they know about the birth of Jesus because they study the stars. In the Israelite tradition, neither pagans, or those defined as pagans by the Israelites, nor astrologers are very well thought of. You just need to check out a little bit of Leviticus. In fact, there is a lot that Leviticus doesn't like, and people concerned about the line between us and them tend to read Leviticus a lot, maybe because it tells them who they can actually ignore and who they can reject and who they can dislike. Why would anybody pay attention to them? They're just wrong. And then here come the Magi, and look, they are not ignored. No matter what Leviticus says, we are still telling the story of these three wise men, however many centuries later. Here is an exercise for all of us in Epiphany. Find someone with whom you disagree and listen to that person. With all the lines drawn between us and them, red states and blue states, pro this and anti that, it shouldn't be too hard to find someone that you are supposed to reject. Find someone and really listen. You might be surprised. In my history, I spent some time at an international student center down in Hyde Park, and I was so amazed every year when I would see this interaction between young women from Korea who were wives of business students at the University of Chicago, and young women from Japan who were wives from of business students at the University of Chicago. And what did they know about each other before they came here? What were they learning about each other? Well, the, the Korean women were learning about the horrible things Japan has done to Korea. The Japanese women were learning about the horribleness that is Korea. And then they would sit together in the parlor to learn English. And they would find that the only way that they could communicate with each other was by writing on their hands. Because when you draw the characters out in Korean on your hand, it's very similar to when you draw the character out in Japanese on their hand. Then the Korean women would start to tell the story of the Japanese empire from the underside. And the Japanese women would start to listen. And then they would start to cook and share their favorite gifts. And then they would start to go to the park with their children. Our impetus to remain in camps of us and them is very strong. In Advocate's history, Advocate Healthcare, where I have worked for a number of years, we have struggled over the years as a faith-based healthcare organization to figure out what we actually think about unions. As you can imagine, we're a corporation. We don't think well about unions. But even amongst the chaplains a few years ago when, a union, when the SEIU was aggressively organizing an advocate, even among the chaplains, there were terrible arguments about us and them, about what, how the unions were bad and advocate was wonderful, or how advocate maybe wasn't so wonderful and maybe the unions weren't so bad. I turned to my ex-husband, who was a union organizer for SEIU at one point in his history. And I said, why does it have to be so adversarial? Why can't we find a new way to have this conversation? I mean, the chaplains were struggling to find a new way to have this conversation. And he said to me, the world, Janet, is adversarial. Our impetus to remain in our camps of us and them is very strong. A few days ago, the New York Times reported on the negotiations within the United Methodist Church. In light of their long-standing and difficult argument about the full humanity of all people, 
And last year, they voted to stop honoring each and every one. And last week, they finalized how various factions of their grand communion can separate from the whole and go about their own way. <clears throat> our impetus to remain in our camps of us and them is very strong. What are your stories of us and them? One of my key values in my life, it's maybe because I'm a middle child, is loyalty. And friends have often heard me say, do we like them? Meaning a friend is telling me something, something about someone else, and I don't have an opinion about them yet, and I'm not going to form one on my own. And for some reason, this, this stranger is causing problems for my friend or my sister or my son. Like, this could be at work, this could be anything. And I'll say the sentence, do we like them? Like, I'm going to take your opinion of it. Meaning, of course, that whatever my friend says, I am going to follow suit, us and them. Our impetus to remain in our camps of us and them is very strong, but it doesn't have to be the only impetus that we live out. Sometimes something else emerges. When the national setting of the United Church of Christ moved to Cleveland, the church home there for some reason thought it wanted to own a hotel. I don't know, we've now sold the hotel apparently. But at the hotel, guess what? The employees wanted to unionize. And the UCC owned the hotel. And so all of a sudden, we were we a church that has a long-standing pro-union, pro-trade union stance, didn't want to have union employees. All of a sudden, we were a corporate boss, and we just moved into the role that corporate bosses play. And then they reminded themselves of their commitments to support workers over the years. And they took a step back. They might even have prayed, sat in silence, and sat with each other. And they decided that they were not going to engage that discussion as a typical you, us, boss, with workers being the typical them union. Our impetus to remain in our camps of us and them is very strong, but it is not our only impetus. Our impetus for life, for connection, for communion is strong as well. We learn us and them on the playground with our brothers and sisters. <laughs> Susan and I have some us and them stuff over Christmas. When we take on the fight of our friends, we learn us and them. Us and them is an outgrowth of that very communion that we seek. It's an outgrowth of solidarity and friendship, of family, of clan, of tribe, of growing up in the same town, of rooting for the same team. Patriots, anybody? <laughs> Not here, I'm sure, except for one person in the back. How do we break us and them down? There is an amazing um, psychoanalyst, psychologist person named Yvonne Agazarian, who is British. And she works a lot with, a, with how human beings work together. She studies, like, how do we as a group actually join together and work together? And one of the things that she, she talks about is learning enough about the other person that you think is so much like yourself that you actually figure out how you're different. That's how you break it down. That's how you break us and them down. That's how us and them become all of us together. You sit with those who are like you. You go and find those who are like you, which is generally very easy to do. You go and find those who are like you, and you sit long enough and talk long enough and listen carefully enough to actually find out how you're different from each other. And then you go and you find those who are different from you and you sit and listen and talk long enough to find out how you are similar one to another. With those who are like us, once we scratch the surface, we find out 
that we are different. Similar in many things, but not in all things. And with those who are different from us, once we scratch the surface, we find out that we are similar in ways. Different in many ways, but not in all ways. How do our perspectives of another change? How do we get out of our camp of this is us and you are them? Is by listening, 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 and sharing. I purposefully said listening three times and sharing once, right? Because I know if you're like me, I jump to the rebuttal before the period has even landed on my ears. Sitting with and listening to and sharing help us understand who the other person might be beyond the broad categories we might have lumped them into. In the text before us this morning of Paul talking about the ministry to those who were them, when Paul was writing, the Gentiles were them, they were them, and the Magi, the strangers traveling miles to visit a baby and welcomed by that baby's family, no strings attached. These are stories of us and them breaking down. Epiphany is a season of surprises. The most unexpected things are going to happen. Are we ready to move toward them? Like the Magi moved toward the star. Each step that we take moves us and them closer. Amen. Let's go forth in the world and look for those epiphany surprises 
those people who, well, they're all, but we're going to sit and listen and listen and listen. May you find someone who will also sit and listen and listen and listen. Go in peace.